<laughs> You're too late, Sonic! I am now forklift certified! <laughs> oh my god! It's been five years since Sonic Forces. Damn, I'm old as hell. Which just might be my least favorite Sonic game of all time. Now, stuff like Rise of Lyric and 06 might be objectively worse made products, but what Forces did was just so much more offensive and has since then aged like cheese. If you want my full thoughts, watch my review at your own risk. And now we finally have a new mainline game. Not just another installment, but a big next-gen platformer, letting you freely control boost Sonic in 3D. The big question at the time was, did Sonic team learned their lesson and were they going to put their entire pussy into the next game. Honestly, by this point, as a Sonic fan, my expectations were on the floor. All I wanted was a game that was fun. At this point, there was nowhere to go but up, but even then, it's not like they were going to have a clean and steady launch. I never lost hope though, even amongst the hellscape of what transpired from that presentation, I was sitting back hoping, praying, manifesting that it could still be salvaged. So, is Sonic Frontiers fun? Fuck that, do we finally have a somewhat passable Sonic game? Yes. Yeah, I really liked it. Find out more after this music montage. Yes, believe it or not, they finally did it. In my humbly correct opinion, this is easily the best 3D Sonic game since Generations. Believe me, the competition was steep. Sonic Frontiers is a really good game. I'd even go as far as to say I prefer it over Unleashed in terms of overall quality. It's still not perfect though, it had a lot of problems that soured my playthrough, sometimes to an annoying degree. However, just to be nice and provide some structure, I'll go over all the things I loved about Frontiers, and then we can start bitching. First off, Sonic controls really well in open world. They have since changed up the controls with the homing attack going back to how it was in Unleashed and the boost to now being on the right analog. At first I thought this was ridiculous since it was fixing what wasn't broken, but it was easy enough to get used to and I've actually since come to prefer it. Sonic has all his moves from the previous games, the boost, homing attack, the slide, which never gets used, along with the drop dash making its 3D debut. It's not the most useful, but it is fun to use especially for going down hills and slopes, plus the double jump I'm happy to report is actually a useful tool that gets you more than a single wet fart of distance. The only move I can think of that didn't make a return was the stun attack from Sonic Lost World, but don't worry because here they amped it up to 11, as Sonic now has a full-fledged combat system with a skill tree and everything. This has to be one of my favorite additions to the series. It is mostly flash and button mashing, but the moves are way too cool looking and satisfying for me to care. They also added this new side loop which lets you interact with objects, stun slash disarm enemies, pull rings up if you're in a pinch, and lets you pull the camera back while you're running because why the fuck not. Another thing I want to mention is after you max out your ring counter in the open world, you get what I like to call the oh shit boost. And if you want a tip on how to traverse in the fastest way possible, first get all the rings and then using the side loop make an infinite symbol. This will give you unlimited boosting for about 3 minutes at a time. This combined with the oh shit boost is incredibly fun. Almost as fun as randomly tripping over something and getting flung into the skies covering a hilarious amount of distance. And if you're planning on speedrunning the side Space levels for those S ranks, here's a speedrunning tip for you. It's called magnet dashing. Here's how it works. You're going to activate a homing attack, and just before it hits the target, with the right timing, you can do this. Do with that as you will. I also hope you liked rail grinding in all the previous games because it's like the main thing you'll be doing here. At the very least, they were kind enough to provide the SA2 shoes for maximum trippancy. The world of this game is split into three main islands, with the last two territories being discount versions of the first one a grassy plain, a desert plain, and a volcano plane. At first glance, it might seem like it's taking heavy inspiration from Breath of the Wild, which it does. I mean, come on, the boost gauge being the stamina meter, the ancient ruins all over the place, the cyberspace levels being in the exact same vein as the dungeons, the fact you can use shit you collect to purchase either health or speed. None of this is me complaining, though. Breath of the Wild is easily my favorite game of all time. Honestly, I'm happy they took inspiration from Zelda of all games. Trust me, this comparison will come into play later on. Okay, now I'm gonna get into what I consider the best part 
parts of this game. The story and characters, the bosses, and the music. Let's start with the bosses. After Sonic obtains the seven emeralds on each island, he transforms into Super Sonic and fights with what this game calls the Titans. Easily the hypest and most well thought out parts of Frontiers. The spectacle and ferocity found in these battles is unmatched. You have all the same moves as regular Sonic, just obviously stronger with the ability to fly and you die once you run out of rings. Chaining combos together and landing parries against these guys clears almost every Super Sonic fight before it. The fact we went from Super Sonic being a DLC extension in Forces to this is absolutely insane. However, I've purposefully neglected to mention the best thing about the Titan fights and my favorite thing about Frontiers. This is the first fucking boss! Roll! Roll! Now listen, Sonic games are infamous for having great music, but this was the first time they've tried something new with things like screaming and super heavy metal instrumentals reminiscent of games like Metal Gear Rising. The craziest part is that I don't usually listen to songs with that kind of stuff. I do love a ton of rock and metal bands, but stuff like this... <laughs> Not really my style, but these tracks are so well made and such a fresh change of pace that I have been bumping to them for weeks now. They are so good, man. Sonic Team never have to go this hard, but they always will. We were fucking robbed. The final great thing I'll say about Frontiers is the story and characters. This time they brought in one of the comic writers, Ian Flynn, and I think he nailed it because this game actually feels like it has something to say. And the best part is that it's not all up in your face, and what I really appreciate is how they handled the character interactions. You could tell just from Sonic's deeper voice that he's matured, and the cast have what feel like real conversations that aren't just big dumps of exposition. They are aware of the situation at hand, but it gives the time to show what these characters actually mean to Sonic. Whether it's him talking to Tails about him finally growing up and steering his own ship, or sitting down and talking with Knuckles about him leaving Angel Island and hopefully getting him some echidna shorties. But then there's stuff with actual story progression where we learn about the Titans and even the origin of the Chaos Emeralds. Spoilers! there from space. Sonic needs to restore the memories of his friends and break them out of cyberspace, which is why you go through familiar levels and the further you get into the game the more corrupted Sonic becomes, all the while helping out these little creatures that have connections to the chaos beings named Coco. Eggman is still present in this game but is quickly sidelined as once he creates an AI in order to access the ancient's technology, he gets sucked in and remains in cyberspace for the majority of the game, protected by said AI. Everyone meet Sage. I wouldn't call her an antagonist but she she does serve as a bridge between the two worlds and over the course of the game, watches and admires how determined Sonic is to win and never give up, despite his outcome already being decided. This inspires her to break her corruption and by the end ultimately save the day. I gotta admit, I almost got a little choked up because Eggman genuinely did care for her and that ending scene was just like... Damn. I'm really happy with how Frontiers turned out. I wouldn't say it's Sonic's big break, but it definitely gives me hope for future games, since they now have this entire engine and world to build off of and expand upon. Sage was awesome, that Knuckles prologue animation was awesome, the music exceeded my expectations, the game actually has some length to it, and I cannot get over this box art. It literally gives away nothing. Not even Sage is featured here. Compare this to the shitty MCU poster and forces, it's absolutely insane development. Congrats Congratulations, Sonic Team, you finally did it. It's not shit. Oh, God. Oh, my God. They did it. They pulled through. Oh, my God. They made a game. It's not a steaming pile of fucking shit. Oh, my God. They did it. They made a game! That's not shit! It's not shit! It's not shit!
hate the boost in this game. I thought it was bad in Forces, but not only is this the slowest and least satisfying boost in the entire series, to the point where it doesn't even feel like it's working half the time, forcing you to spam it over and over again just to keep a constant sense of speed, but you can't even plow through enemies anymore. This boost sucks. I hate the drop dash. I said it was fun to use when going down slopes and hills, and that's it, because you can't use the drop dash in any other scenario. No speed carries over. Once the drop dash ends, it just stops. It's completely useless since it's close to impossible to maintain speed using it. Look at this. Look at this. And I wish that's all I had to say about the lack of momentum, but they just couldn't stop there. No, this time, they took it a step further. If you so much as jump, all of your speed gets left on red. It doesn't matter how fast you were going. If you jump, it's like you hit the invisible boat mobile or some shit. What was fun about games like Sonic Generations was quick reaction timing and keeping up the pace as best you could. But here, especially in cyberspace, it's just not feasible and everything is just so much slower. The game actually just discourages going fast, it feels like. I hate that the homing attack has like a two second delay. I hate that you can't stomp them boost like in the previous games. You either have to wait to bounce back up or move forward ever so slightly so that Sonic can get his warm-up in. I hate the fact the parry system, even on the hardest difficulty, requires no skill. All you need to do is hold both shoulder buttons and you chillin'. I didn't even know this at first, I was timing that shit perfectly. And even after I found this out, I still tried to time it because I'm not a fucking beta. But for real, that's terrible design and should have only been reserved for things like easy mode or at least have the option of turning it off. I hate how inconsistent the S ranks for some of these stages are. For example, in the second cyberspace zone, I I want to show you the best time I've gotten on that stage. y'all think that was pretty good? Well, if I was even two seconds behind, I would have gotten an A rank. Now let's apply those same kind of strategies to another level. I beat that stage in like 30 seconds. You want to know what the S rank requirement was? A minute and 10 seconds. What the fuck? I hate the fact that when you go to this motherfucker to upgrade things, it doesn't let you purchase things all at once, which means if you want to increase your speed to max level 99, you need to do it one at a uh, time. Whoever designed this needs to be arrested. Oh shit. I hate the way the slot machine bits appear and you have this little box that takes up so much more of the screen than it needs to. I hate that you can't run on water. I know that's a nitpick, but still. I hate the fact that you can't boost while you're on this skateboard. Could you imagine if in Sonic Generations you weren't able to boost while riding down City Escape? This is horrendous. I hate the pinball game. It requires way too many points and left a bad taste in my anus. I hate the fact there's no drifting except for this one stage. Does this look fun to you? Cause it's not. I hate the mini bosses. Now the titans are fire and some of them I did find fun fighting like the caterpillar and the various cyber ninjas, which for some reason were giving childbearing hips, but enemies like the fucking thing where it pulls the camera away when you didn't mean to interact with it, or the spider where once you side loop its legs you have to skydive for about three weeks until you can hit it again, and do not get me started on the shark. If you don't kill him the first time around, you will be stuck waiting to hit him again for minutes, and I mean absolute fucking minutes. Oh god, not him again. <laughs> but whatever, those aren't technically the real bosses, and if you wanted to, you could skip the majority of them. However, if you beat the game on hard mode, you get the real final boss. Is this a joke? Are you pulling my dick right now? This is no contest without a speck of a single shadow of a doubt, the worst final boss in all of Sonic the Hedgehog. This is fucking garbage, holy shit, how did they fumble this hard in the end? This is not fun, this is just sad, I'm sad, I hate everything about this. And as for my final complaint about Frontiers, I know most people will probably eat me alive for this, 
but the open world is almost completely empty. There's not many interesting obstacles or structures for you to explore. There are some, but not enough to keep someone interested in playing once you've beaten the campaign. There's really not much left to do besides just running around, which I understand is Sonic's whole thing, but realistically, how long until that gets boring? I understand it's not really a fair comparison, but since it wants to be like it's so bad, let's bring Breath of the Wild into the equation. When we take away the side stuff, bosses, just the story in general, what exactly are you left with? In Breath of the Wild, even with the basic kit, you can cut grass, you can cut trees, you can collect food, interact with people, fight all kinds of different enemies, ride horses, climb literally anything, customize your inventory and outfit, use things to cook other things, the list goes on and on and on. In Sonic Frontiers, you can run around, collect memories, climb only certain structures, talk to about four of the characters, do some simple puzzles and quick time events, fight about two types of enemies, and go fishing with Big. You know what, I think this might have just saved it. Uh, Sonic, I don't think you should be touching that. Editing note, my ass was in my mouth again, and thanks to Monster Hunter, Sonic is in fact cooking. In conclusion, Sonic Frontiers is still a really good game. For me, the good stuff definitely outweighed the bad, but I have to ask, Whatever happened to releasing games when they were finished? Nowadays, even Nintendo are releasing half-baked garbage. Not even half-baked, like one-fourth baked garbage. I wouldn't say Frontiers is anywhere close to that level, but it's still clear things were rushed, like splitting the first island into thirds. The constant pop-in that's incredibly hard to ignore and constantly jump scares you, especially in World 2. Not to mention some of the animations being either incredibly stiff or just look terrible. And don't get me wrong, a lot of the animations are super well done. Sonic in certain scenes is easily the most expressive if he's been since Unleashed, which is extremely apparent with Knuckles for some reason. Why does he always give him that face? Parents still think I'm going to college, but I'm not because I'm afraid of becoming a homosexual. Although it's never to the level of cartoony games such as Crash 4 or Ratchet and Clank. But by far the biggest example of this game's rush development is easily the final boss. You will never convince me this was the original plan. They clearly wanted to do something bigger but didn't have the time or budget. If you want my fanfiction input, I would have just taken off my pants and went downright stupid with it. Have like a planet-sized titan that even Super Sonic can't beat, so he has to discover the true power of the emeralds and transform into hypersonic. They have not used that form since Sonic 3 and pretty much anything outside of Sonic 3 to this day. I'm sure fans would like to see that come back in some way. And I don't know, have Sage take over the Titan once it's weekend and keep the rest of the ending the way it was. Obviously Sega didn't and at this point probably will never do something like that, but this... This ain't it. All I can hope for the future is Sega takes what they've built now and uses it to create even better Sonic games in the future. Make the world feel more lived in, make Sonic more satisfying to play, and keep building on things like the combat system. The biggest problem with the Sonic games was the fact they always went back on something even when everyone liked it. Props to them for never being afraid to experiment, but please don't let this be a case of something that clearly has potential, but never actually realizes it. Oh, and please never use Green Hill again after this. I'm at my limit. I never want to see this shit again. I'm giving Sonic Frontiers a solid 7 out of 10. WAIT! There's still something that even the most dedicated Sonic fans have yet to mention about this game. Now what does that look like to you? That's right, this game is obviously a direct follow-up to The Black Knight, but most people don't actually know the true story of King Arthur, and that's where I pass this video off to someone who's much more qualified to break it down. It's finally time. He has brought me forth from my prisons and mines to unveil the truth upon this world. With all my heart and all my power, I shall inform those who do not know the fate of Sonic and his fellow woodland creatures. So as we all know, there was at one point a game called Sonic and the Black Knight. Essentially, Sonic gets summoned to a world by the Merlin equivalent, Merlina, which is a highly uncreative name, and I can't believe they didn't just put the fate dude himself, actual Merlin. Somehow the fate rendition of the characters are better, even though there was an incest baby between two women somehow, even through technical rape. I don't understand how that happens. <laughs> Sonic is sent down on a quest to King Arthur, pretty much just to kill him. I don't believe he's actually King Arthur, but we'll get back to this later. He goes throughout the world and meets up with Knuckles, who is Sir Gawain, Shadow, who is Lancelot, Silver is Galahad, Jet the Hawk is Lamorak, and for the sake of my sanity, I'm not going to give SBO or the Princess Narzan mentioned in the list any sort of mind. And instead, we're going to focus on the ones I have. As you know, Galahad is an ally to Lancelot, often discussed in the book after the defeating of Galahad, and Blaze the Cat, who takes the position of Parzival 
or Percival if you're a person who can't stand anything that doesn't sound English. Which in that case, you're gonna enjoy listening to me! Inevitably, he wins by becoming Excalibur Sonic before Merlina reveals herself to be evil. Go figure, all women are. And finally they face off. It's important to note that she is nicknamed the Queen of the Underworld. Eventually, Sonic wins on account of being Sonic, and then he gets to be the one true king. Now I'll begin with my theory. King Arthur in this story isn't actually King Arthur. The person you fight is King Ryans of Gore, or Sir Meliagrance, as opposed to King Arthur, as both were at some point denoted to be the ruler of the Underworld. As I said before, Merlina became the Queen of the Underworld, so it would be safe to assume that the man in the armor also has some association with it. This means that in the story, Sonic is the actual true King Arthur. Now my theory doesn't end here. We know that Arthur inevitably has an illegitimate son, Mordred. Now while that is absolutely a girl's name, and the mother of said illegitimate son is King Arthur's sister, my guess is Sally Acorn, good to assume that it's Tails. Tails is Mordred all along, and this isn't the only issue. Mordred in inevitably kills Arthur at the Battle of Cam, which means that at some point in the future, we're going to see Tails stab Sonic in the leg and watch him bleed out in a slow and painful death in Avalon, leaving us with an ambiguous question on whether or not he lived. I hope he crashes. Off of a cliff. In a chariot. In a blaze of glory. I fucking hate Sonic. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the end of my theory. Because I also believe that Amy is absolutely Guinevere, and inevitably becomes the Queen of Camelot. Good thing for Sonic, right? <laughs> No. Inevitably, this ends with Mealy Grit stealing away her way for his own lust, and then Lancelot, Shadow, coming in to bravely save the day, getting the damsel in, dis damsel in distress. Needless to say, they fuck. Honey, I'm home! What the fuck? No, no, this isn't the end of the story. I'm almost 100% sure Galahad was in there tag teaming that pink hedgehog gash to support his homie. No. And I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't know how to feel about that. Honey, I'm home! Orgasm sequence initiated. Don't even ask. Now, while this may be a lot to take in, this isn't all. Eventually, as we all know, Mordred takes over Camelot for a long while when Arthur is off fighting the Romans bravely which ended with Arthur inevitably returning home upon receiving a letter that Camelot had been overrun by the forces of Mordred. It was now under his command. While I hope that the reign was peaceful during a short period of times, I can only imagine that Tail had a raging little man syndrome. Now to continue on with this, Mordred had been left with Guinevere. Needless to say, Mordred being an edgy guy who wants to stick it to Arthur, and Guinevere being a horrible wife, they fucked. I'm not making the same joke for the third time already, but needless to say, I am going to say Tails was into some twisted shit, because immediately after that, he had a bunch of dogs tear Amy to shreds and left her to die. This wasn't the only time Arthur was cucked, because in many stories you'll think, see things like Arendite and Excalibur. In the story of Arthur's gay name Excalibur, the Lady of the Lake specifies that it is the best sword, and then Lancelot walks down about 15 seconds later and then asks for a weapon and gets Arendite, a slightly better sword than Excalibur, and a ring that cures all enchantments when looked at. Go figure! This isn't even the t only time it happens. Galahad and Arthur went on a walk one time and Galahad saw a sword in a stone and pulled it out! And it literally had, whomever draws his blade from the stone will be the greatest knight alive, written on the side. Which means that not only was Galahad slightly better than Arthur in knighthood, but he also took his entire shtick, pulling the sword from the stone. Now this isn't even to start getting on Parsifal, who pretty much gets cucked consistently. He's said to be the third best knight, behind Tristan and Lancelot. Now, doing a little bit of basic assumption, you can assume that Galahad is a better knight than him, putting him at fourth place. And then you have Galahad, which is said to be on par with Lancelot, making him fifth place. He keeps going down the scale. Poor, poor Jet the Hawk. Jet the Hawk doesn't get any recognition in this story. So, as we understand, I've been given a limited amount of time. I wanted to keep it short and sweet, like a slap to the face rather than a grinding pain. So I want to finish this off with something that none of you are expecting, the crossovers. So as we all know, Mario appears several times in the Sonic universe, thus making him canon and a repeating crossover character. After careful consideration, I have decided that there was a character like him in Arthurian legend, Sir Roland of Charlemagne's Palace. Now I know what all of you guys are thinking. How does Roland come into play here? Why is Mario of all characters important? I want to talk about a particular story. What about Roland and his beloved family? Our story begins immediately after the death of Roland's wife, where he was filled with a blinding rage that caused him to burn and level towns in his fury. But that's not all. To stop him, a single knight 
had an idea to calm him down. This knight was the cousin of Roland. Now who would be the cousin of Mario? After careful consideration, I decided my best option would obviously be Wario. And now for the big unveiling. Estolfo is the name of Roland's cousin. So now that we can associate name with knights, Estolfo is Wario and Roland is Mario. So now that we've established this, allow me to explain Wario's plan in detail. Wario decided that the best way to calm Mario down would be to wear the clothing of a woman and serve and soothe his nerves, which to me translates to sex. As these stories have a habit of going that direction, what wasn't planned was how well it worked. Needless to say, they fucked. Bring me your glowing bussy. Honey, I'm home! <laughs> Now since you've gotten an image of Mario absolutely railing Wario's glowing asshole, I'll give you some reassurance. At least you can say to someone who tells you that a Estelfa from Fate is straight that they're a fucking liar, and that you can know better than them. Additionally, remember that all of this is canon in Arthurian legend, which means that inevitably you are damned to see this happen to your favorite blue hedgehog. I fucking hate him. Yeah, that's great and all, but what's your source? Chapter XXXIV how Sir Lancelot hurt Sir Tristan, and how after Sir Tristan smote down Sir Palamides. Then his cry was so large that Sir Lancelot heard it. And then he got a great spear in his hand, and came towards the cry. Then Lancelot cried, The knight with the black shield, make thee ready to joust with me. When Sir Tristan heard him say that so, he got his spear in his hand, and either abashed down their heads, and came together as thunder. <laughs> Join me next time when I talk more about Arthurian legend and how Arthur gets cucked at every corner. Now put me back in the cage. No. <sighs> okay, I <laughs> did. I lost my spot just because of that. Oh, the... no. <laughs> I should do my normal voice. No. <laughs> Don't clown out. <laughs> <laughs> Don't joke. <laughs>